Hello there and welcome to The Value of Everything. This episode was recorded a few days after the US election in 2016. It begins with a prior conversation Michael and I are having in relation to religion and then we lead on to Trump as president and our views of how he will lead. Also within this, there is a long piece where we cover aspects of racism in the West. So let me now pass you over to Michael. Yeah, there's a certain group, I'm sure you've encountered them already, of people that are very enthusiastic about all things science. Um, They have this... Because when you they, they feel that when you resort to the scientific method, that's when you can finally get to the, you know, the reality of a situation. And I, for the most part, agree with that. But I think that they go they become a little too confident in some of the assertions out of the scientific community that really haven't been established yet. Yeah, like, um, let's like say, for example, if I was trying, if I was going to have a debate <coughs> on religion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's that one argument in religion which I, I can I can slightly accept, but I can't accept at the same time. Is where if mm-hmm. there's no evidence to prove s- something is true, then it cannot mm-hmm. be true. And I'm just like, oh, it's like yeah. I mean, I, okay, you're right. That's that's a fundamental thing about science. But I just say, well, but things have always been proven incorrect at some points and stuff like that. So it's sure. not. Yeah, I understand the th- thing is like until the evidence provides itself to say something else, then you lean the other way. But yeah, I right. guess it's good to keep it open minded, isn't it? Really, it's not necessarily when it, you know, when it comes to religion, it, I think the entire basis of it is that it's supposed to transcend uh, what human beings can empirically investigate. Like w- we rely on our fi- on our senses and on the scientific method to arrive at the truth of. Uh, of a certain matter. But when it comes to issues of spirituality and faith and God, all of that is supposed to be beyond man's grasp, as it were. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, I'm not a religious person, I'm, I'm materialist, but I think a lot of the arguments that come out of the new atheist movement are kind of silly. One of the uh, better Christian apologists which is kind of ironic because he's a Marxist, but um, some, he sort of goes after this logic. Uh, his name's Terry Eagleton. He's, he's primarily a literary critic, but he's he's written some really good critiques of these new atheists, people like Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins, Hitchens. Yeah. People like yeah. that. Yeah, and um, yeah, anyway, I, 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 I want to try and stop you there, Michael, because we're going to lose some really good uh, bits here, I think. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but... Um, if um, listeners listen to the uh, the shows that we put out beforehand, we have been talking and discussing about Donald Trump and the elections and things like that. And surprise, surprise, Donald Trump has come into power, which is um, is pretty incredible. Now, um, I think in the back of my mind, I thought, like just from a popularity stance, that stance that um, Donald Trump really should have won, but like for for a long time because he was probably the better politician he connected he sort of when when he was doing his speeches i just was listening to him and i was thinking boom that is really just connecting that that would definitely connect with people far more than hillary's um i oh, was was um i'm with her and and things like that it was just a disjointed like that's where you that's where you can see that you can just throw so much money at a situation with the campaign and it really just stifles and there's no real direction because there's just too much money and just it's and obviously the front person isn't quite as charismatic as well as Donald Trump. And people do not quite realise how charismatic Donald Trump is. Everyone thinks he's a, a, a like this kind of dangerous man who everybody hates, but he is actually very charismatic at the same time, particularly where he appeals to young men and men in general. So um yeah, times we're what is it now? Uh, November the thirteenth, two thousand sixteen. It's been a few days since Donald Trump has won the elections, and um, I guess yeah. I just I just want to get your theories on like what what you wrote in your piece recently, just how you summarized your thoughts about this this event. Um, like and 
how do you sort of take what is happening right now? Does, do you feel like it's a kind of a, like a thing where nobody really trusts the media now and say, for example, like uh, the left and the, the black vote, they just go, what the hell is going on here? We thought that Tillery was going to win by a good margin and, oh, no, I guess the whites are all racist after all anyway. <laughs> I, I mean, there is a lot of that going on right now. Uh, I mean, honestly, you and I have been discussing uh, this election for a while now. And even I was surprised that Trump won. I I had a feeling it was going to be a closer race than people were saying, especially in the final week. But um, I really thought that Hillary would have done a better job of, um, you know, ca- at least embarrassing Trump to the point where he wouldn't have such an enthusiastic turnout. But I mean, she's just such a horrible candidate that that really didn't matter in the end. Um, Trump, uh, this narrative that it was just racists who who voted for him and that this is just a um, reflection upon how um, xenophobic American society still is, is just fallacious. If you look at the um, exit polls and the studies that are being done right now, what happened was Trump managed to attract more. Well, he had an enthusiastic turnout, even though all things uh, taken together, there was fewer people who, who turned out to the election in general. He still managed to capture most of the white vote. He captured more Hispanic and black votes than previous Republicans had. He still was able to um, take most of the white female vote away from Hillary Clinton, which was surprising. Um, but but what it really represents, as I tried to convey in the article I wrote on my blog, is that um, there's a legitimation crisis happening right now. And I wasn't fully aware of how far it's come. Uh, but people are just so dissatisfied with the status quo that this was more a vote against the elite than it was a vote for Trump. Um, I mean, that's not to take away his enthusiastic uh, support base, but um, overall, what really tipped the balance was the fact a lot of people are just dissatisfied with how things have been running in this country the last decade. As um, And also, like um, I guess what the old Clinton saying, the economy's stupid as well, came into uh, the thing there, because... <laughs> The economy's going rough. It's the third yeah. term. You're going to get kicked out, aren't you? Basically. Now, I, I must admit, I was I actually um, just put a comment online to to one of um, Francis Hunt's uh, uh, videos that he said of predicting what was going to happen, and I had said this is going to be a contested election with Hillary being uh, the winner. Now, I thought mm-hmm. there would have been things. I I was um, I'm a little bit more inclined to think sometimes. Well, something sinister is going to happen. There's, there's potentially there's vote rigging and things like that, which might happen, and then you're going to get this contested election. You might have like this big legal battle that goes on for a couple of weeks. Um, but I should have thought a little bit more on the Brit Britexic side because it was just the exact same carbon copy of the Britexic in every way. How like. I could tell that the Brit exit was far more popular, had the, the much more of a grounded root of what was going on. Um, there's so many similarities. Um, populist mm-hmm. leaders coming into power, like coming in there, they had by far the better arguments. They were by far the more charismatic people. Well, you know, you could say probably on the Brit exit side, you had like very old, sort of like your Camerons and things like that. But it just, he, he didn't really have any, anything to go on really with his arguments. The, the, the reasons to stay within the eurozone budget like and that's just like an old dying economical thing of um, elitism is just really just uh, screwing things up so again with the similarities were all there and set and then I, 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 again like the, the one thing that was really um, doing my head in was like the exit polls and how even and you, you think where the money goes you you got to pretty much follow it so the gambling sites as well were all set for a prediction for Hillary Clinton but the one thing that was you you must say to a certain extent was either heavily inept 
and or maybe even corrupted was the exit polls and how the media would translate that out to the people. But then Mm -hmm. when it came to the point of the actual election itself, the results showed that a conspiracy or um, just didn't wipe things out. And it showed that Trump was unanimous. Now, maybe it was even more than that. Maybe Trump was just like even even more of a greater winner than comparison to Hillary. And they were trying to stave off the vote there. But yeah, in the whole grand scheme of things, it did sort of tip the balance um, pretty remarkably. Um, I just also just to to outline where I, I mean I I just get to your actually let me just get to your thoughts on that point anyway just for for the meantime. Yeah, yeah, I think there are a lot of parallels that people can draw between the um, Brexit and uh, this Donald Trump populist phenomena. Um, it's really just a sign you, this notion that people are going to continue to entertain this lesser evil logic that um, the elite continuously try to push, and not just the uh, the bureaucrats, but also the uh, liberal punditry and the, uh, the uh, mainstream journalists. That, yeah, you know, Hillary Clinton, for instance, she's a flawed candidate and, you know, things are going bad, but under a Trump presidency, just imagine how much worse it could be. Like, people aren't playing that game anymore. Um, there, I mean, I think that there is some naivete in thinking that Trump is really going to be able to, um, deliver on what he promised the electorate. So, um, for instance, the wall and, um, a more protectionist trade and and all of these things, he's going up against entrenched, um, special interest groups and, more than that, um, the logic of capital accumulation, which um, he's not going to be able to succeed in, uh, if he even intends on following through with it. But nevertheless, um, that's why I've always made the the point that Trump's victory matters not insofar as what the consequences will be practically, but in what it symbolically represents. And, and the same goes for the Brexit vote. It represents that um, the dominant hegemonic ideology is no longer holding currency with the masses, and that matters. That's because even once um, things don't improve, that's only going to intensify the dissatisfaction. People are going to start thinking outside uh, the box even more, and that can that can be interesting. That opens up possibilities for um, more radical perspectives. Just um, because. Everyone thinks, okay, well, the, um, America's a divided nation as well. But t- don't you ever think, like, you know, like the celebrity culture and the group think between that and how they've been just, like, pumping out all of this, um, let's say, propaganda for the meantime. Um, mm-hmm. You've got, like, uh, De Niro having slants and all that kind of st- The media really going after him. And then, and then, like, you can think of all this, like, your country folks from these uh, rural towns just saying, up yours to all of those people. Do you think there's like this? Do, uh, do you think like this celebrity culture? And I guess you sort of categorise these in, in a certain area, anyway. How do you see those people in comparison to your rural people as well? And um, just on top of that, how you, this entire event? How does that? How does that get um, put into some kind of uh, categorising time frame? inside of marxism theory is there like things that are mentioned about this kind of event happening well um marxism in terms of its uh, sociological model is predicated upon the um divisions in society between uh class and their material interests so it, it starts out with the notion that um class societies are divided in a fundamental way now, um, once you start incorporating elements of culture and ethnicity um, on the superstructure level, that all plays a part as well um, in terms of how people think and, and behave. But Marxism would say that the, um, the more important, the more um, revealing division in society reflects uh, class interests. Now, when it comes to um, Hollywood and 
these elite groups and the division between um, town and country and, and all of this, um, there, there's, there's class that's, that's at the core of it. And um, this, the hegemonic ideology in, in the United States today and in Western Europe is basically a bourgeois liberalism yeah. where um, we were sort of instructed from an early age to consider um, you know, racism and sexism and all of these uh, notions of oppression that that exists in society, and to to be opposed to them on the basis of um, meritocracy and equality of opportunity and all of these things. What what's interesting and convenient for the the class system is it doesn't challenge any of the underlying economic structures um, that exist and and. Western Europe and the United States. Um, that And that ideology, you know, it, there's quantitative differences in terms of how far people push it. You know, we live in a society that's nominally committed to equality between the races and sexes. But if you go on to, say, elite college campuses or Hollywood circles, you see that same ethic accelerated and exaggerated and that's not connecting well with people. I mean, um, with, with that narrative, just to, sorry to interrupt you there. I mean, if you're like I don't know, just like uh, the the a, a demograph like um, I don't know, you're you're gay, you're a black gay woman or something like that. Okay, it's, that's a bad example actually. Just um, let's just say you're a black man. Okay, for one. Okay, if you act conf- uh-huh. if you act confidently and you try and speak your mind and you you, you act the way that you want to get get forth in society you do well i think if you're a woman okay if you go into a very male oriented um, area and you act confidently and you you do your training and stuff like that you get on i don't i don't necessarily i'm probably going to get um, hate mail for this but I, I just i don't see too much of like this glass ce- ceiling culture that happens too much if you can if you're ballsy enough you can really that's probably the wrong word to use but if you're if you can really assert yourself um you get on in life i don't necessarily see that there there is this it's it's this victimization culture isn't it where you just say oh you're weak you can't uh, there's 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 no uh, everything's um set up to against you i don't yeah i i just i think if you can really pursue pursue the things that you want to get in life and you really uh you do these things it's you you're definitely going to succeed yeah, I agree that um, this ideology of victimhood probably stifles uh, one's potential in life if you belong to one of the groups that's deemed oppressed in society. Um, however, I, I should also say that I the the general response you'll get for something like that is, well, you know, even though you know, there's there's been a decline in racist, homophobic, and sexist sentiments on the surface in society. There's still this ongoing um, structural racism and structural sexism. I'm, I've never been um, presented with a compelling model of any of that. Um, and even if, if I should encounter one, there's all kinds of just assertions and empirically unfounded claims. I, I don't find any legitimacy in them. I think that what ultimately is holding back certain groups in society is a combination of their class position and sort of cultural hangovers from previous class formation. So the slave society that, I mean, if you're a black American, for instance, um, a lot of their social pathologies derive from that history um, and they're sort of hangovers. They can be overcome and they've gradu- gradually been uh, overcome over the years like the position of a black person today is uh infinitely better than it was 100 years ago and even significantly better than it was 30 years ago so things are improving for them so the notion that that, you know there's still this egregious victimization happening to all these in these uh minority groups is unfounded and you know they've asserted their interests and they've made a lot of progress and there's there's one other little thing as well is that if you can be this is a I'm trying to like put this these thoughts together but if you can be uh, 
I'm probably saying this word too much, um, charismatic or personable, and mm -hmm. you're a minority, then you're mm -hmm. an underdog. And in most people's psychology, if you're an underdog dog that people like, people want to put you ahead. I, I don't see many situations where, like, unless you're really ultimately like racist or anything like that but in general if you if i see like um confident woman she's really likable and stuff like that yeah i would like to see her succeed confident black man who really um who's who's really likable yeah i want to see him succeed now if if you just switch that personables thing and you make him confident and really like um uh, just annoying and just sort of like i should be better than everybody else and that, or that kind of stuff then then you've got like the total opposite effect that happens there but i just i think that's the key really just be like a, a likable personality and and be confident and assert yourself this you, you're the underdog on top of it you're going to succeed i can't see how that many times it happens unless you've got some you've, you've literally just tried to you're trying to climb up the ladder of the Ku Klux Klan or something it's just it's it's impossible <laughs> No, you're right. And in fact, there's there's been a lot of research done on this topic. Um, when you control for things like IQ, when you just uh, examine life outcomes for people, um, personality has a crucial effect in how uh, one's life circumstances and income is um, in the long haul. Personality, but even appearance, there's all kinds of things that that factor into where one ends up in life in a class, uh, in a competitive class society. And uh, there, it's true, like, there's a preference for um, minority groups or groups that have, are considered historically disadvantaged, um, that especially in corporate America, they try to elevate them because, for one thing, it makes them look good because diversity is considered um, to be some sort of uh, social good now. Um, so just having a diverse uh, corporate hierarchy reflects well on them. And, this, uh, you know, it's also a matter of what you were just describing, that it's it's good to see someone from uh, uh, relatively uh, underperforming groups start uh, doing well in society. And if they're personable and nice and uh, competent, then, you know, you you promote them and you you favor them even if if necessary yeah i mean i must admit like that, that you know the corporate culture of just um pushing forward people of um, diversity is i i find is a load of bullshit at the best of times because it's it, i i think it's just like it's, it's almost racist and sexist to those people in itself because it's given mm -hmm. it's given uh, like an unfair advantage to them and like it's is it's almost like saying, "Oh, yeah, you deserve a um an advantage in life." It's just like I don't know. It's just like saying, "Like, oh, um, you you Marxists in um in American society, you're always going to have it tough, so we need to give you like some benefits and stuff." <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. I I don't believe in affirmative action as it's been practiced. I I do believe that um it, it may have been of some utility once upon a time, but I always viewed it more in terms of providing opportunities for people from disadvantaged class backgrounds. Um, I thought that there was some legitimacy in that conception of affirmative action, but as it's been practiced, I don't agree with it. I don't agree with the corporate uh, diversity logic. I don't, personally, I don't think that diversity is a inherent good. I think that it's fine. I'm not against diversity, but I also don't think that it possesses some sort of uh, divine uh, logic or anything like that. There's nothing intrinsically great about it. There's a lot of other things that we should be considering, but diversity per se is not particularly important to me. I am against the oppression of groups based upon their sexual orientation, gender, or um uh, ethnic background, of course, but I don't think that you know we need to have this perfectly diverse um, society in order for us to view ourselves as having constructed um, a just order. Yeah, I mean, I must just say that, like, obviously, there's there's two things that spring to mind as well. Is just the the fact that um, if, say, for an in a capitalist society, if you can like if you can uh, provide a service for a lot cheaper than, say, like a white man and you're f 
um, and you're doing it for like half the price, well, the just in general free market society, that that person's got a price advantage. So you're in in that kind of situation, racism comes out of the window or sexism comes out the window, and eventually, because of the the price advantage, you will take on that person. Now, on another side. I can understand one little segment of where this comes in and people say, well, there's a lockout. There's like a, say we're, we're in some kind of, we're in some kind of uh, profession where there's never been a black man or there's never been a, a, a woman in, in our profession. You can potentially see that if, especially if it's sort of a profession where like um, family members come in there and stuff like that. And it's a very in like a groupy kind of uh, chummy kind of, boys club kind of thing then mm-hmm. um you can see that there potentially would be some kind of lockout and there'll be no no um no, there'll be a limited um uh, there, there's limitations for them to actually get into there but once your foot's in the door there's access to that point then then i think yeah once you, if you've got as long as you've got access to to that arena then it really you don't need to advantage them at all Right, right. There's definitely truth in that um, competitive logic. But uh, just to push back a little bit, um, I have read um, compelling arguments from studies where perception matters in a competitive environment. So let's just take the example of, say, a landlord, right? Um, Let's say you're a landlord and um, you're considering people who have applied to rent your unit. And um, one of them is a Asian woman, uh, 30 years old, let's say, has a job, no criminal background. Um, The other person also doesn't have a criminal background, but they're a young black male. Now, how you perceive each of these groups matters because you don't have the time or wherewithal to investigate each person's biography. You're just looking at applications. So if black men are considered to be, you know, prone to violence or criminality or what have you, you're going to disregard them and go for the Asian female because they're viewed as generally docile and competent and what have you. So you're using both of these um, um, gender and uh, ethnicity as heuristics. So what you what your perception of groups is matters. So let's, but it could be that in this particular case, these individuals, the black man is actually a very law abiding, competent, uh, good, potentially really great tenant. And the Asian female is sloppy and, you know, she might cause issues with the neighbors, but you'd never know that. Yeah. I just, I, just go sorry to interrupt you there. Um, just there's sure. two little things there. I, I, probably the example there probably, probably might need to be tweaked a little bit because a woman and man and black and uh, Asian is just a little bit tricky um, because, mm. because I, it, say if it was like a white man and a, a middle-aged uh, uh, Asian woman maybe mm-hmm. yeah it's, it's a little bit tricky um, so yeah just, just say for example white man uh, black male for example in that situation right now say if I'm a landlord and I meet them both Mm-hmm. And yet I get on with the black man better and I feel like I can trust him more. I would go with him. Now, maybe I'm maybe I'm the wrong part of society and maybe I'm sort of a bit more progressive. I don't know what that is. I would probably mm-hmm. if if that guy I could feel I could sense that this guy is more trustworthy than the other guy. I don't know. The, the white guy is a little bit more creepy. He's got stains on his shirt and um, he's got <laughs> like these little ticks and stuff that he's like scratching yeah. himself all the time. I want to go for the black male. It's just th- that kind of thing. Now, you, you might try and go, okay, right, all things equal. Now, you try and really equalize things to the max and literally the exact same personality and everything else. Oh, mm-hmm. may- maybe you might have in-group preference, but it's really like you're really scraping the barrel for me at that point anyway. Right, right. Well, the reason I chose uh, Asian female is because we're taking two groups that are conceived of as being relatively docile to other so asians and females are viewed that way whereas males and especially black males are viewed almost in the opposite way yeah um and the problem is whether or not there's truth behind it 
um, in terms of how groups behave, there's always exceptions to those rules. That's true, yeah. So, um, so a female isn't inherently docile by virtue of their being a female. There's always exceptions. And in these particular cases, let's say they both seemed fairly nice in the interview. Um, or let's say you didn't, you personally didn't interview them. You had someone else do it. You're just looking at the paperwork. Um, your, your biases are going to reflect in how, on the decision you make in that respect. And it might end up being biased against someone who, uh, you know, didn't reflect their group's behaviors. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's my only pushback against that. I mean, I think that this plays a role in these sort of uh, decisions. That doesn't mean that society is inherently racist. It doesn't mean that st structural racism is legitimate. But it, I should also say that, you know, prejudice still matters in, in some sense. Yeah. I, 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 actually, going back to your example as well, this is probably one area that you probably could say. Now, it probably you're probably going to turn this um, theory that I had beforehand on its head a bit, but if you're a landlord, what do you want? Do you want some charismatic, brash guy, or do you want some quiet person who's just going to pay the bills and not complain too much? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. So, so you're yeah, thinking yeah, in yeah. terms of what's what's ideal from a tenant. You want yeah. them to pay your, their rent on time, and you don't want them to cause trouble. Yeah. Um. So that's what you're after. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, and so, so you're gonna use your prejudices potentially to, for that example, but then right. I don't know, maybe turn it on its head. You've got some very smart black man who has got a couple of computer magazines with him in comparison to a young Asian woman with um, some color in her hair or something like that. You, you're probably <laughs> going to go for the black man there at that point. So it, oh, it's it really. Yeah. There, there, I would say if there is going to be some kind of in-group preference or racism which is occurring here on some kind of prejudice, it's, you're talking about a thin line. You're talking about something that's so thin line and uh, margin-based. It, well, this is probably from my perspective. Maybe, maybe people in general are, are slightly different, but from my perspective, you're talking about a very, very cutting thin line. And it really, all it comes down to is just the fact that I potentially could relate to a white person more than a black person. But it's really, we're, we're talking about very like marginal things. Like I can have conversations with a black guy um, like where, where we're t talking like, I don't know, about women and stuff like that, which I'll never have with women, for example. It's just like, it's all these, right. just all these kind of things, which is, you're really cutting the the margins mm -hmm. so much. But I think what overrides that always is the the preference to the character of the person and the um uh the personality of the person as well. sorry the character and uh what's the other thing just just the, the um the background of that person as well as much as what you can assess of that person the the appearance and things like that as well so yeah that that's my perspective I could be totally wrong but yeah just to and I I I would say that my perspective is probably the the masses as well I'll also go far mm -hmm. as that would you you're probably in the same boat as me I'd say Yeah I I mean I'm not trying to say that um this is this boils down to a notion of like in group preference I think in group preferences exist and they matter but in this case cuz and mind you I haven't reviewed this literature in a long time but when I had um this phenomena that I was describing cut across races. So let's say um, the landlord was black, right? Um, he would still have a preference for the Asian female in the hypothetical yes. scenario yeah, exactly, because yeah. um, he knows that that group, in terms of how he perceives them, would be more reliable in, as a tenant. So it's the logic of the position um, that one is applying for and also how groups are perceived. So it's a matter of prejudice. And, uh, you know, and, and the, people... the situation and the environment of what it is as well. Right, right. Exactly. Very contextual. Um, so a black landlord might well have more in common with a uh, black tenant, but he's thinking in terms of his interests as a landlord in that capacity. Um, so this is where these group biases and prejudice matter. Um, and, and once again, you know, it, it could be. It could be true empirically that black males um, on balance commit more crime and they generally exemplify that behavior. But 
the problem is individual black people um, are going to be discriminated against as a consequence of it. And where you choose to point the blame for that group perception is you know, a matter of debate. But I don't want to get bogged down in this too much. I was just trying to <laughs> yeah. push back. Again, yeah. I'm not uh, someone who who believes in systemic racism and all that shit, but um, yeah. <laughs> that's, I just wanted to throw that out there. No, no, no. I just I found that it's, it's really interesting just to explore that topic anyway because it's... Um... I think over time there's just been some kind of clouding of the mind and where people just say, ah, oh, it's racist straight away. So just yeah. to, I think just to to really get bearings and defog and demist that, um, that category of racism is really important because like, I don't know, just speaking offices and things like that, it's just like, oh, racist. It's, it, it's actually coming into a common <laughs> joke now. Oh, that's racist. Old oh, right. um, Tony's racist or something like that. It's just, it's, you, you you just get you get so um uh, it, it just gets to a point where like everything becomes racist after a while yeah. but you really you need to explore the subject before you really understand what racism is and then and then mm-hmm. and then uh and then you, wh- you yeah you whittle it down after that so let's turn back just Very quickly true. to um to Donald Trump again so mm-hmm. you know where my mind sometimes wanders with Donald Trump because you know, with the uh, the alt right, they were just I could see them like all dancing around and celebrating. Yes, we've won. This is like some kind of like great movement. This is uh, what's the um, what year did they get rid of the British in America? Oh, um, seventeen seventy six. Yeah, that's happened again for <laughs> America now. So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah. So and I was just like, oh god. Like I mean, to, to be honest, right? I'll, I'll give you my feelings, right? I, I was. I don't know. In in is something in the in the base of me just says, "Oh yeah, this is this is quite a good feeling. We've got somebody who's potentially going to he, he's more of a free market economist. He believes in the smaller government. There's all these great things that are, that, that are in that are that potentially could transpire from him. However, you've got some kind of guy from the 1950s, this kind of like, you know the the TV series Mad Men, that mm. old traditional guy you you almost got the people that just come into power after like the um the the great crash in the 1930s which um sort of put in uh glass steagall and all that kind of stuff those really strict kind of old guys that are just uh, you got those kind of people in power now really with uh, mayor giuliani and and things like that so um in some ways yeah i was like yes this is good but then at the back of my mind i'm definitely not celebrating that much you know how my mind works. I mean, I will still look at Trump's actions to think that if he's controlled or not. I know it's like this sounds very conspiratory, but I just I I always wonder. He's he's had a lot of money in the past, and his banks that have been um, passed to him throughout time. He's like he's to be a property investor, you'd need to really be well well connected. So and he's been connected politically for a long time. So I won't put that past him. I will follow his actions at every stage and let that do all the talking for me rather than what his words are doing. So um, there's, there's, a, there's a point of optimism that, that comes to me, but then I, I know that obviously the economy is going to crash on him at the same time. I'm pretty much sure of, assured of that as you are. So the economy is going to crash on him. And then the one thing that I really just get annoyed with a little bit with him is the fact that, and I, yeah, it is, it is true annoyance, is that almost an- borderlining onto anger is the fact that you've got whistleblowers like your Snowden. They they should be bloody released. They they are picking out as to how society has turned on, on its citizen citizens and they should be freed. I don't like his drug policies either and you've got thousands upon thousands of people that are arrested. And if anything, you can say the war on drugs is probably the most racist thing because that definitely selects that and targets black males and the black which are destructing the family and things like that. So those kind of things I can think, I think Trump at one point, he was a little bit more liberal in terms of like his theories on drug use, but the way that he's been wording things about Mexico borders and drugs are coming over the border. And um, I don't see him. He's going to be some kind of liberal leader. Now, don't get me wrong with drugs. You've got this, this, the weird situation of like the, the meth people and people getting, get, losing their minds to this kind of stuff. So, to limit the supply of drugs is kind of a good thing, but just to arrest and penalise people just on the basis of um, them just using plants is uh, is just too extreme. But 
yeah, turning on on the whistleblowers. This is where I'd, I I I can't stand Donald Trump. I think I actually agree with him on a lot of protectionist policies because of the fact that China should be on the trading balance side of things, should be allowing their currency to um, work within a market scenario. You know, you think of um, uh, you go back to uh, Henry Ford where you've got the uh, the workers, the workers need to be paid, and the more you pay them, the more that they can purchase their own goods. Now, the workers in America have lost pretty much the factory jobs that, say, Henry Ford has provided for them, and they, they've got no ability to pay, so the economy's just never going to work. So you need to have some kind of way of in installing the work employment situation and really, the, the Chinese yarn should be appreciating so that American goods can be bought in return for Chinese goods. That's never happened. Nobody's really highlighted that. Donald Trump has made it good ways for that. So, and so yeah, as I say, I'm, I'm re- cautiously looking at um, Donald Trump. I've got, uh, again, I had this good feeling a little bit when he came into power. It's that sort of Brexit feeling as well. But then I'm just following the actions, following the actions at every step of the way. Um, I'm interested in how he's going to work the markets, but he's he's got an uphill struggle. It's, uh, there's there's so many things that can turn on him right now, where it be just a lone gunman. You've got the uh, the media establishment. You've got pretty much all politicians from every side is going to be against him. But I guess the people are kind of behind him anyway. And then you've got your potential thing in the background where. Um, this is the other thing that's coming into my mind as well, is that he could be one of those leaders that could bring in some very authoritarian sort of police state policies where martial law and things like that come into power, particularly when the economy crashes as well. So it's not the brave new world now. You've got the 1984 world where the authoritarian, uh, I suspect authoritarianism potentially could come into the fray now. And um, I was uh, looking back at the word fascism as well. Is it, he does click on every single point where it comes to fascism about coming into power, being very nationalistic and things like that. He's literally hit a lot of nails when it comes to fascism to a certain extent. Not to say that he's an out and right fascist, but he's clicked with a lot of those items. So this is, yeah, this is my perspective of Donald Trump. But there's that thing which I'm very suspicious of. And like even just... You know, of us talking on the internet and stuff like that, and the NSA and the powers that they have to watch us, and um, but like you, you don't know what potentially could happen in the future. You could be just um, talking at home one day, and the and the FBI kick in your door and pull you away for being a political activist and talking against the state. You don't know how things could develop in in that kind of fashion. Yeah, that that's deeply disconcerting. I, that's always worried me. Um. In terms of uh, fascism, I, I'm always reluctant to issue that um, in relation to bourgeois politicians, uh, even Trump, even ones that seem a bit authoritarian, just because I, I tend to be pretty pedantic in how I employ the term. Um, I've read a lot of uh, fascist theory in the past, so I know that you know on the surface level there, there are definite similarities, um, you, but you could point to the same thing with relatively authoritarian, uh, liberal, democratic politicians like Woodrow Wilson. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think sometimes if we employ the term too loosely, it, it starts to become the void of meaning. But uh, I do have those same concerns about Trump's authoritarianism. And I, I should reiterate that I don't have any optimism in terms of Trump being able to deliver not only on his own campaign promises, but even anything that's relatively beneficial for the population. He might be able to do something good on healthcare. I have to wait and see on that. But when it comes to um, issues that he really stressed in his campaign, like um, a more fair trade policy, um, the border wall with Mexico, um, things like that, I, he, Again, my I've never been of the view that um, the federal government possesses the autonomy that a lot of um, conventional sociologists try to argue. Like I think that they're responding to not only um, 
the ruling class's prerogatives, um, which would include, you know, major corporations and uh, Wall Street and, uh, you know, moneyed interests, in other words. Uh, but they also come up against the logic of capital accumulation itself. So what they do is is very constrained within those parameters. And even though Trump postured as an outsider, um, he's still constrained by those same uh, classes and um, the logic of the system itself, which it's going to end up frustrating a lot of his supporters because they're going to get really angry at the fact that he's unable to do what he had uh, said he was going to do. Um, when it comes to China in particular, even though currency manipulation is part of why there's such a huge imbalance, I, honestly, I think the, the bigger story is the fact that Chinese labor was a fraction of the cost of American labor at the time offshoring really took off. They just had a competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis the United States in terms of labor costs, which made a huge difference to the rate of profit that could be made um, in those firms temporarily anyway. Um, so I don't suspect that we're going to see a proliferation of tariffs to the extent Trump was uh, promising. But I am disconcerted because one of his uh, motifs in the campaign was pretty much um, arguing on behalf of subsidizing the surveillance state even more, which was what you were just referring to. Yeah. And uh, that and he hasn't expressed an interest in pardoning Edward Snowden. Um, he hasn't really um, stepped up to help out Julian Assange, even though he was pivotal in Trump winning this election with the uh, the WikiLeaks information on Hillary Clinton and the DNC. Without those, I I really think Clinton would have had an edge over Trump. So, I mean, the fact that he's not really expressed an interest in helping out whistleblowers is also really um, disturbing. But I think his alt-right fans are going to be upset. His um, The middle American white working class that voted for him are going to end up disappointed. Um, but for me, that's all good news. So I'm, <laughs> I'm not I just really... want to interrupt you on that point. If I was a sure. Marxist, I would vote for Trump. Yeah, I, I I didn't vote at all, but um, I think the Slovenian uh, Marx, well, quasi Marxist philosopher Slavoj Žižek made the same argument. Uh, there there have been a few Marxists who made that argument, and I generally agree with their perspective on the matter. It's as I said, symbolically very important. It shows that the prevailing hegemonic ideology is starting to erode. And that's important for those who are interested in going beyond capitalism. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of the, uh, the left is not thinking in those terms. They're still hung up on racism, sexism, all of the intersectional politics we hear about all the time. Yeah. And I don't know, like, I think, like, let me just see if I can sort of, uh, make some uh, predictions here. I, th I think people will be quite surprised as he, he will be a better leader than what people think of him right now in terms of like how he addresses the people and talks and things like that. I think he'll be better than what people think right now just by, mm -hmm. by, by what I see already of him. He's, he's actually a very good speaker. So I think people are going to be surprised, particularly because obviously the media has had the, head, like the headlines all the time. And once he comes in and he starts talking, there's going to be a slight boost. Now that boost will not happen for too long because I think the economy is going to start to go into a bit of a tailspin at some point just because of how the money markets work and how he's anti, he seems to be a little bit anti-banking and how he's getting rid of the regulations and he's potentially worried about things about letting banks fail, potentially. I'm not sure whether he's going to do it, but just you've got to watch those actions anyway. So mm. I'm just very interested in that thing. Now, I'm, I don't know how much this, uh, the riots are going to happen and the police brutality, that could be something different. I'm not sure if that could, that could really um, engulf America. And I know that the, the media is going to really go up in a storm whenever anything like that happens. So that's going to be just an interesting point as well. For him, I don't know whether, see, the, the major problem is, is that if, he does really start to rock the boat with China. 
China's going to dump the US treasuries onto the to the globe. And obviously everyone knows that America's been trying to keep the interest rates at the lowest possible rate so that they can um, still inflate their way slightly out of the mess. They, With the, the low interest rates, they can um, spread that down to the banks. The banks sort of been accumulating a lot for themselves more than anyone else. Um, but also at the same time, that's been enabling been enabling them to keep their the interest on their debt pretty low and maintain a fairly low um, current deficit so that they don't go into much further debt. So that's just the precariousness of what's happening in America. And I, I would say that I would highlight to those being the interesting things that which are going to happen. Now, him trying to, um, you know how he says, I'm going to drain the swamp. swamp. I don't know how he's how he's potentially going to do that. There's so many different things. Even the the American Constitution in itself makes him fairly powerless because of the the way that everyone ha- he has to sort of get an agreement by this people these people. Even though the Republicans have got a majority, I just feel like he's going to be hitting his head against the wall after a while. And maybe he might turn even more erratic as he he can't get negotiations off the table. Now he apparently he's the best negotiator of all time. So I, I'd, I'd be just very interesting to see how that all transpires. But yeah, I just, I, th- I think the one thing that I'm just going to get just, I'm just very tr- distrustful of um, Donald Trump. And I know, look, I know why you have to do this when you're, you're empowered. You've, you've got to keep your state, s- state secrets. It can eventually be your own undoing. And th- th- there is, there is reasons to have secrets to some extent, particularly if you're trying to create this state format. You've got to have um, secrets. You don't want people know about your weapons and things like that, or they're going to just be able to knock you over eventually. So there are reasons for secrets, but I would say that it's it's a fairly dangerous thing, and you slowly start to tiptoe across the line before these secrets and these weapons can be turned against the people, as Edward Snowden has alluded to. So, um, yeah, I always I'm just going to follow the actions. I'm not going to bear too much judgment beforehand there's there's some promising factors particularly from like a libertarian capitalist perspective from my side but i'm i'm just very cautious of the 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 route of you could you could like let's just say there's these big players that are controlling america okay uh for one thing you've got you've got the people and the people got really annoyed with um bush so bush jr so um they got in barack obama who's like this we're um we can change things, this touchy-feely, cuddly kind of guy, and it shows to the globe that um, America is not racist and they can put in a um, a, a, a mixed-race um, president with um, a, a Muslim father into power and things like that. So uh, America feels like it's can't gone forward, it's more progressive, and the globe stage feels like things have gone on. But in the meantime, Barack Obama has been more oppressive to whistleblowers than anybody beforehand. And if anything, he's um, really turned the ratchet on those things, and he's really been adept. But he's really done, not achieved much at all, really, in his presidency. And now you've got like the the turning point of all of that change. People have kicked out all of that that ideas, and now you've got this new elected person who's going to fight for the working class, but he's also authoritarian, and he's a celebrity at the same time. It's just there's it's it, it's almost like too good to be true it's almost like there's been a script written in the background for this so i just always stay cautious on all of these factors Mm -hmm. no it's it's the right thing to do i mean i honestly don't have uh, anything invested in uh, the outcome of a trump presidency just because uh, my perspective is at odds with it but but i am interested in following uh how it plays out and how that affects um, the political philosophy I am devoted to. Um, but, but I am, you know, all of us has an interest in, uh, ensuring that the, uh, surveillance state doesn't get out of hand and that we don't become victimized by the state even further than many citizens already are. That obviously is of, uh, concern, but as you said, you know, uh, President Obama, he ran on a platform that was, uh, quite populist and also, you know, really uh, humane and nice. And, and all we what the practical outcome was, uh, you know, 
a uh, he augmented the surveillance state to levels unheard of and you know he uh had a very aggressive foreign policy the yeah. number of deaths of civilians attributed to drones for instance is just astronomical yeah so yeah so th this is yeah this is where i stand and yeah i think that's where i'm going to probably uh I think that's all I've, I've pretty much got on the subject matter for now. Have you got anything else to add? No, I, I think that, you know, I've stated everything that, that I feel on the matter. If anyone wants to read uh, an analysis or, or rather a commentary on my view of Trump, they can check my blog out. But um, but it will be interesting. The, the next four years, we'll just have to, to wait and see how this turns out.